we'll move to the Pacific and we'll talk about a team you and I both like uh, as a Stanley Cup future, the Calgary Flames. Yeah, I'm I'm high on the Flames as a Cup future. I think one thing that we're as we dive into it, reader or listeners are going to notice, like I'm pretty high on a fair amount of teams in this division. So my favorite way to attack the Flames is with the Cup outright because I think they have that upside. That said, I think that their points total could get cut into a little more than than people think. And there are a lot of avenues where I think they could lose the division race somewhat at the time. So, yeah, I think the cup outright future is my favorite play on the Flames. Uh, they're still going to have really solid goaltending with Jacob Markstrom. They brought in Mackenzie Wieger, who's going to bolster what should be a really solid defensive core. Uh, and we saw under Coach Sutter last year, they played really structured, really good hockey. Kind of fell apart a little in the postseason, but... I think the upside to win the cup is is still there for sure. Yeah, they're hanging around like 16, 18 to 1. They are priced to be a w- little bit worse than Edmonton, who are the favorite to win the division. I think that that should flip. Uh, like you, I like the, the cup future. I think if you're going to bet this team, just they're not only are they uh, a team that just feels very steady and just going to should be able to make the playoffs almost, you know, much more often than not, but they're they're also going to be a tough out in in the postseason. Like this is a team that's deep. Uh, they're they're kind of full, chock full of those like cliche tough playoff type players, uh, and then they have the upside of uh, the the Uberdo types. Uh, and like in, in a weird way, like Markstrom, the 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 situation with, that Markstrom in is in is like maybe the best in the league right now. So like. As a he's a great goaltender, we already know that, but he's also going to be insulated. He, you know, this is a good defensive team. Daryl Sutter will make sure of that. Uh, and like you said, I think the defense got better with Mackenzie Weger coming in. Uh, they they also bring in you know Nazem Kadri to. They lose Kachuk, they lose Goudreau, they bring in Kadri, they bring in Weger, they bring in Uberdo. Somehow they might have got better from from even after losing those guys. So this is a team. Yeah, I there's not much else to say. They're one of the best five and five teams last year. They were the best team at preventing five and five goals last season. And I think that stuff is going to carry over to the season. The offense might take a little bit of time to click, which does scare me in terms of like point totals or division, whatever. Uh, so yeah, the, just go big on the flames or. Yeah. And I think we saw their bottom six was ugly in the postseason last year. I love Sonny Milano. I think I was waiting to see what team gives him a PTO and it was the flames. And I think he's going to make it and stick. And if he gets a decent role, I think he could actually be somewhat of a relevant addition. And then, yeah, you talked about the insulation. Like I don't think Markstrom's a better goaltender than Thatcher Demko, but I would probably personally bet he finishes with better numbers just because the defense he's going to play behind comparatively. Yeah, I would agree with you. And I'd also agree with that Sonny Milano, a good long Island boy. Uh, setting Milano is let's let's talk about the other side of the battle of Alberta uh whereas I think the Flames are uh slightly underrated despite their status as a Stanley Cup favorite I think the Edmonton Oilers because of what they did last season uh that run they went under they went on under Jay Woodcroft where they were basically playing at 119 point pace throughout the regular season then they beat the Flames in round two uh, and played closer than the the sweep would suggest against Colorado in round three but everyone, because of McDavid and Dreisaitl, they they made the Jack Campbell move, so they should have their goaltending, you know, quote unquote, situated. We'll talk about that, I'm sure. Uh, everyone's higher on Edmonton than Calgary. Not that I'm fading Edmonton entirely. I think that they make the playoffs. I think that they're just going to be a vulnerable favorite by the time we get to the spring. Yeah, the Oilers are a team. I'd almost say I'm fading them. Like I'm not playing them in any markets. I know this this could go badly because those two guys at the top could carry them pr- pretty pretty far, but I don't think they're going to get more from them than they saw last year in the postseason. And you could talk about maybe things could have gone better versus Colorado. They also got to round three, beating a very depleted Los Angeles Kings team in round. Like that was a they were hurting, and they beat them in seven games in round one. And I think a couple games in that series, we we're hearing all the same narratives even from Oilers fans where they're picking apart their team and management and then they come out and they win that series in seven games and they get by the flames which credit to them was was a huge win for them and obviously here that counts for a lot to win that series but I think we're starting to reach a little bit on the upside of this team when I think there are still some clear flaws and then yeah Jack Campbell 
I think I literally personally know dozens of Oilers fans that love to rip on Toronto last year and specifically rip on how Campbell couldn't take that team anywhere. And then somehow he comes into this, into Edmonton, inheriting what I think is actually a worse defensive team. And he's apparently about to thrive. And for me, I just think that's, that's a bit of a reach. And I think there's a lot of things that need to go right for this team to be a legit cup contender. Yeah, the, the assumption that Campbell is just worth like five million five five times five contract is is interesting uh it's a weird change in narrative uh they the the Leafs saw the best and worst of Campbell last year he was incredible for the first couple months terrible in the middle got hurt started to trend back up and was good enough in the playoffs to be on a team that should have won its series but I mean, you saw you saw Jack Campbell the Jack Campbell experience in in a nutshell there uh which is we don't know. We just don't know if he's, I think he's going to either be, you know, slightly above average, slightly below average uh, with, with, you know, these kind of peaks and valleys uh, by the time the season ends and Stuart Skinner. I know there's some people high on him as a young goalie as his backup, but you know, this is his first true go around with an NHL role. So who, who knows? And yeah, it's like the, the, to me, the Oilers and flames, they should be swapped. And I think Vegas, who we'll talk about next is a little bit closer to Edmonton uh, that the odds suggest uh, the Knights bring in Bruce Cassidy from Boston, who, I mean, it's so funny that this is how coaching goes these days, except for the very few, uh, like, you know, John Cooper's of the world, uh, that you just eventually wear out your welcome. But Bruce Cassidy was a great coach for the Bruins, had them as one of the best defensive teams in each of his seasons, never missed the playoffs, got them to the Stanley Cup final, to game seven of a Stanley Cup final, not that long ago, 2019, when they lost the Blues. And now he takes it over a team that has enough offensive upside that he should, he's a good fit. Like he should be able to get this team defensively sound. He's got his, he loved to lean on uh, like Charlie McAvoy and really ride his number one defenseman. And he's got one in, in Petrangelo. He'll have, you know, Shea Theodore uh, healthy. So this is a team that because of all the things that went wrong for them last year, there was automatically going to be a little bit of buyback value on. And then Robin Leonard gets hurt. Uh, we don't know about Laurent Brossois. Their goaltending tandem looks like it might be Logan Thompson, who I know you're pretty high on, and Aiden Hill. So like that kind of deflated the price even more. So all of a sudden, I think Vegas is looking like a, a buy team uh, heading into the season. Yeah, I think they are. Um, I think Bruce Catch, Cassidy at, to win the Jack Adams is a, a very realistic bet. Like what we saw from Boston, that team was always super structured, very successful, looked really sharp and just just winning the right way and i think we could see a lot of that carry over and yeah vegas uh, you know they're a team that i think we we talk about it with jordan bennington where it's like we can pretty much just say the average person doesn't like vegas doesn't like the way they've been managed but i think that is kind of blinding some people to the fact that this is still a really strong roster and what they went through last year like yes ultimately the way things went they didn't make the postseason it was a little ugly they also had some of the worst man games lost situations of any team in the league. They got essentially nothing out of Mark Stone all year. So supposedly his back's better coming into this season. That could be a huge addition. I'm still pretty high on Jack Eichel. I know you think he's a solid play to win the heart. And I, I completely agree with that. He's got all the tools. I think people are probably sleeping on just how much upside he has as a player. So I think they do still have some elite pieces and pretty reasonable depth. And I think, yeah, Logan Thompson, he's unproven, but he has the upside of a lot of other middle of the pack goalies in the NHL. And we talk about, you know, extensively how many starters do we know for sure are locked to be really good quality goaltending in this league. And it's a pretty short list. So I think there's teams heading in with the worst duo than Vegas. And, and yeah, they're a team I'm going to be looking to get involved with this year. Yeah. I like uh, Eichel. He's 75 to one uh, to win the heart. Uh, he's, healthy playing for a team that has playoff aspirations and he's got a supporting cast uh his best supporting cast of his career we've seen him at b- before he got hurt he was like a point per game player in his healthy seasons on a terrible buffalo team so if you think he can play 82 games and you know you add a few points because of the, the quality of teammates all of a sudden you're getting close to 100 points and uh he'll have the bounce back narrative so i i like the knights uh Investing in the Knights in that kind of way, like Eichel, like you said, I think Cassidy is a good shout for Jack Adams, Logan Thompson, whether you want to bet like the rookie of the year markets or best in a long shot, also worth it. I think 
this team is is someone you just you want to be on board with rather than against uh at their current price because of uh their roster and the market sentiment on them the los angeles kings were the surprise team that took vegas's playoff spot last year they're coming in at 35 to 1 to win the stanley cup they were pretty close to triple digits last year you're expecting a, another step forward from los angeles i think they're pretty fairly priced I, I don't know how much i believe in the goaltending like jonathan quick was great last year uh but this is supposed to be cal peterson's team he he didn't really show very well last year i still think he's fine uh but you yeah you're buying the kings yeah i'm still buying on the kings the market's dipped a little so probably getting a little less uh value with the current prices than what we saw earlier in the summer but i still think it's really likely this is a really good team they fought through a lot of injuries at the end of last year and they still it it allowed a lot of their young stars to shine and and develop and guys like Sean Dersey, I think are really going to take steps forward this year. Mikey Anderson's a stud back there. So their defense of course is actually one that I really like. And I think holds a ton of upside. If they can get Drew Doughty healthy and playing effectively, they've got a lot of reason that I think they can be quite strong at both ends of the ice. And then yeah, Kevin Fiala, another player I love, he gives some legitimate offensive punch. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that can work out right for the Kings this year. I agree with you on the goaltending. It's definitely a step beneath some of the other teams in the division. But I still think they're they're a young team that I expect to take steps forward this year. Uh, it's a similar situation, I think, with Vancouver. Like, it's a, a young young team. They have the upside. But the market and pundits, fans, everyone kind of seems to be handling Vancouver with a lot of uh, – they're handling them carefully almost like they don't want to. I think if this was before last season, a lot more people would be like, Oh, I'm, I'm all in on Vancouver. Like we, we, we'd see that kind of with Winnipeg a lot. Like people like this is the year Winnipeg's going to take a step forward and uh, you know, do what they did a, a few seasons ago when they went to the Western conference final. But I was surprised that people seem to be pumping the brakes or at least, you know, they'll get to the line for Vancouver and then they just won't step over it to like, be like the person is saying like, Oh, I'm all in on the Canucks. Um, and that's kind of how they're priced. I think there's like, if there's going to be like a team that just comes out of, out of nowhere and, and cracks a hundred points from, from that middle pack that nobody's expecting, it'll be Vancouver. Um, uh, but I also could see this thing just not working out because of the defense core. So I, that's my way of saying I'm with everyone else. I'm, I'm being careful with this team. Yeah, I agree. I like the upside of the Canucks too. And if it seems like I, like a lot of metropolitan teams, I think it's because, or sorry, metropolitan Pacific teams. It's because I do comparatively, like I think this year, the narrative's flipping a little where we might see five teams out of the Pacific make the playoffs and three out of the central. And for the previous couple of years, that's not been how it's been at all. That would have been quite a hot take to think it would have gone five and three. And I think this year it's a possibility. So yeah, like there's, you know, cause I'm fairly high on Vegas, Seattle. I think Vancouver a chance to get, get back into the mix. I like a lot of what they're, what they've got going on. So yeah, I think, and, and that also ties into why I'm a little lower on the Oilers and why I think they're a team that I tread lightly getting involved with just because they're, they're really strong when McDavid and dry settle are doing what they're doing, but we're basically counting on them absolutely dominating and being healthy in what's going to be a much more competitive division. So yeah, I think Vancouver, another team, like I'd hate to endorse them to be bad, and I think the defense core is going to be a, a clear flaw. That's obviously the one thing everyone's going to point to. They've got a pretty strong top nine up front, especially if Kuzmenko comes in and makes a difference. Pud Colson could be a useful player. I, I still like his skill set a lot. And I think Boudreaux is going to find a way to tap into that a little more um, with a full training camp. But yeah, they're, they're a team with some upside. And I think Thatcher Demko, he's the best goal in the division. Like that would be my opinion. I don't think I'd even debate it. I really love Thatcher Demko. I think he's tremendous. So yeah, I think Vancouver for me is still one that I, I'm fairly high on, but I'm just, the division's going to be sneaky tough this year, I think. Uh, if you listen to our season preview podcast, where we went over our favorite uh, NHL awards, I talked about Demko as a, as a heart trophy flyer. He's like 18 to one or so to win the Vezina. I just think that if he has the type of season where he's able to beat out Vasilevsky and Shesterkin, Sorokin, Saros and gets this team to the playoffs because of that defense, it, it will be a monster season. And he's like 200, 300 to one to win the heart because he's a goalie and goalies very rarely win. We've had four since 1997 and one since 
uh, I think only once since 2002, which was Carey Price in 2013. So I, I think that's the way I would invest in Vancouver is, is backing him uh, to win the heart. But yeah, this is a, it, it, there's a few teams out there where you could tell me yeah, uh, you're going to wake up in April and the Canucks are going to have 103 points. And I'd be like, yeah, it's fine. Or you can tell me they're going to have a hundred or they're going to have like 84. I'd be like, yeah, it makes sense. Maybe things went wrong. Yeah, because so, that the decor, like they're and the way they were playing too, they're just chipping everything out. It was kind of ugly. That was Boudreaux's main solution. He came in and just and I think it's possible teams and they ran really good in one goal games under Boudreaux. We all knew they were about due for an uptake, but they did run really good in those one goal games and really, really got great results from Demco down the stretch. So that's kind of the knock. I think there's a lot of pros with regards to the offensive core that could work out outside of I think JT Miller's probably a logical step back candidate, but Besser, Pedersen, Kuzmenko, put Coles in. There's enough talent there that I think there is, there's some things to like about that team for sure. I, I don't think there's that much to like about San Jose, which here's a surprising nugget from last season that I didn't know. Uh, I do a 32 team preview uh, on the action network where I kind of just go uh, through each team. It's kind of size up where they are in the market whether I think they're overrated, underrated, just right, give out an actionable bet to take away. The San Jose Sharks were the team with the most unders last season, which is really strange because their defense was not great. And their goaltending, you know, James Reimer was good, but he was James Reimer good. He wasn't like, uh, you know, Shesterkin or Saros level. Uh, so that surprised me. And I think that we'll probably see a market correction there. So I like thinking, because I don't think this defense has got any better, probably got worse. Um, I like the idea of backing sharks or looking to target sharks overs uh with a Kakinen and Reimer tandem behind that defense which lost you know Jacob Middleton and, and Burns who I know is not a great defensive defenseman but um and then the forward group I, I mean I don't know what their the plan is here with uh you know doubling down on you know Tomas Hurdle now they got to pay Timo Meyer they've got Logan Couture on a big contract already Eric Carlson on the defense is already on a big deal so it's like really hard for this team just to tear it down to the studs so they're just in this weird i call it worse than purgatory like because they're much closer to hell than than heaven uh <laughs> so uh I, I think that even at these prices like i could i think seattle's better than san jose uh and i could see the sharks ruining being the team that like really frustrates us and ruins our flyers or blackhawks worst record in the league bet that was exactly what my in post is gonna be i don't have a lot I'm playing or looking towards on the Sharks at all. I'm hoping they avoid, there'll be a team I'm hoping to fade having the worst record in a market that I I got those the Blackhawks and Flyers involved with. And yeah, there's, I don't think a lot of upside with the team. There's enough strong veterans there that, you know, should keep them from being the league bottom. And that's why, you know, I, I don't think they're a strong play at plus 700 to be the worst team in the league or whatever the maybe plus 900s are out there. But yeah, I, I think pretty safe to be fairly bad and just hopefully not too bad. Uh, and a reminder, we will preview the Sharks and Predators uh, season opening trip to Prague in the Czech Republic at the end of the week, Friday and Saturday. They open the season uh, with an episode on Thursday morning. Uh, so stay, stay tuned for that one. And then we will be back on our regular Tuesday morning, Thursday morning cadence uh, following that. And you can, of course, listen to all our season preview pods anywhere. You listen to Line Change, and our Eastern Conference preview is also on the Action Network podcast uh, channel. All right, let's talk about uh, the Anaheim Ducks, who finished one point behind San Jose last year, which is a little strange because Anaheim had that crazy winning streak in November. Like Usually when you have a streak like that, you're going to make the playoffs, but then they just completely capitulated. Uh, Trevor Zegers is hurt. Uh, He he got hurt during the preseason game. Not totally sure how long he's going to be out for. the Ducks did something strange this offseason uh, where they going into the summer, it looked like they're they're going to not do exactly what the Blackhawks do, did by just tearing things down uh, in, in order to tank, but come close to it. And then they signed Ryan Strom, Frank Vetrano and John Klingberg. So, yeah, a little that was a little weird and, and it kind of raised the floor on the team a bit. So I actually think on a game to game basis that this team is going to be bettable, assuming Zegris, by the way, is okay and, and like healthy uh because i like john gibson as a bounce back candidate in goal i don't think the defense is terrible as like bad as like the rest of the, the teams in this range so anaheim is you know I, I i said that 
the Sabres, the Coyotes will probably be the teams I have the most individual bets on throughout the season. I think Anaheim will be up there as well. I think that they'll be a little underrated on a game to game basis at big numbers. Yeah, some of those they so they brought in the vets, and I think you can see how they shouldn't be too bad. The floor should be pretty reasonable, safely away from the bottom bottom. I think maybe I'm a little lower on them. Some of the moves personally, and the next team, obviously the last team we're going to touch on the crack and they end up with this guy. I didn't see how Anaheim weren't very interested in beating Seattle's offer for Bjorkstrand by uh, something. I think they should have had a lot more on the table to take that, especially when they followed up by signing veterans. But like you said, while they still have Klingberg and, and Strom should be able to build on what they did last year to an extent. So they could be a team that ends up being a little undervalued to start the season. Yeah, they're, and I actually think Dallas Eakins is is a fine coach as well. Like I, I, I maybe I'm wrong because he's now uh, on his second team, and uh, they're they're not terribly close to making the playoffs. But yeah, I I, I don't know. I I, I think I think just to touch on like kind of a general NHL can't, uh, handicapping note, I think the Ducks were a really good example of it last year. So we saw them; they came out and they clicked into gear early, and they were playing better, and they did run good in in close games early, but they found their form and it's always important to try to watch for that early, try to try to pick apart the teams that are coming out surprisingly good. You don't want to be too rigid in your, in your mindset of exactly what you expect from a team. But with that said, as the other teams clicked into gear, we saw they were still just playing at the same level and they started to fall apart late. So it kind of went from a thing where early on you could find some value with the ducks and then they became kind of a logical regression candidate down the stretch. And that's kind of, there's always going to be a few teams, I think, like that that are rated quite poorly coming into the year, and you can kind of clearly see they've they've got a little something going, and they whether it was just things going well in training camp or that sort of thing. I think that's always something we want to watch for heading into the season. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about the team that finished last in the Pacific last year, the second year Seattle Kraken. They finished on sixty points, a minus sixty nine goal differential. If you're listening to the show, you probably know this already, but the Kraken had just absolutely awful goaltending from a tandem that nobody saw that coming from, especially with the defense defensive personnel in front of them. So you can just just by leveling out Grubauer and Dreger, <laughs> for some reason they signed Martin Jones. Um, but just like leveling those guys out, you you're already adding like probably eight points, ten points to this what they did last year. Then you add Bjork Strand uh, and some better puck luck offensively. And this team starts to becoming a floor of 74, 78 points. And that's enough to like start getting me involved in them, on, especially on a game-to-game basis. I think the the Kraken, relative to where their price are, are, are by. Uh, we love Bjork Strand. Andre Burakovsky gives them more solidity in their uh, you know middle six. He's, he's, he can play anywhere on the lineup. He's he's won two cups now, uh, Burakovsky. Good for him. Uh, Jordan Eberle, Jared McCann, and like uh, – Janus Schwartz like that's not a, a great you know you're not going to get great production out of those guys but if kind of everybody performs to their career average of that bunch uh that I just mentioned this should be an all right team uh so I think the Kraken are going to pay off on a game-to-game basis throughout the season yeah they were a team last year they were it was my worst take for sure entering the year I thought that they we're going to be fairly good. You and weren't alone. Perfect... Like there, there were some people yeah. who had them ranked. Like I saw one model. I can't, I'm not going to bring it up, but like who it was, but like there was a, a you know, pretty respected person out there who had them as a second, second best team. Yeah. In the there was, a, I, I mean, and it's easy to pinpoint the number one thing that went wrong. Cause the drew bow, the goaltending tandem, it seemed like one where I thought it was gonna be like a one, a one B type scenario where we're thinking they're collecting a good amount of points from the backup compared to some teams. And they got a solid starter in front of that. And it ended up being the exact opposite, but the, their team this year, I think their ceiling is way higher than people think. So I'm going to go back in. I, I think <laughs> they're a team that I'll be looking to bet on. So hmm. we'll, we'll see how it starts to play out, but they're one that entering yeah. the season, I'm expecting them. I'm expecting things to go a lot better. And I like Maddie Beignets. They got, you know, enough upside with the young guys, the decor should be solid. The goaltending tandem has got to be a little better. So yeah, they're a team entering the year. I think it's very realistic that they're far better than the sharks and the ducks in the division. That could definitely be something I'm wrong about moving forward, 
but it wouldn't surprise me if they end up a lot closer to the playoff race than yeah. people expect. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that if you're going to pick like one long shot to make the playoffs, it would Seattle would probably be the one because like you said, we could see five out of the Pacific with the, the central landscape being what it is. It's not a guarantee Los Angeles uh, builds on what they did. Maybe Vegas doesn't bounce back as well. And then you got Vancouver, who's uh, like we said, kind of high, high upside, but also has a pretty low floor. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's annoying to say because both you and I were, were, I, I wasn't, all in on Seattle last season, but I was definitely higher on them than uh, I thought I was going to be. And it did not work out well uh, at all. So uh, right back, right back to the pain train, the crack and pain train, two, two years, two years in. And, and I they're easy to like too. Yeah. Like I want to root for them. And I think yeah. the logic is there. They have, they don't have those top stars, but they have a, a lot of depth. Like yeah. it's, it's a sneaky amount of depth, I think compared to a lot of these specific and- teams. And I have one thing too that kind of gives me a little bit more reason to believe in them, which is they they're gonna be a little desperate to be better. So let's say they do start hot, you know, whatever, they're in the playoff mix after 15 or 20 games. They could be the type of team that just says goes to Chicago and says, What do you want for Patrick Kane? You know, like or to, you know, another team that's that's fallen out of the race. What do you want for for this player? And 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 completely just by adding one kind of star producer changes the the facelift of the team. So, uh, and they have the room to do it obviously. And, and, and the assets. So if, if Seattle, if Seattle does come out of the gates hot, like I would say, look out that, uh, but uh, that's what I said last year too. 